Water police found this $14,000 yacht aground in Dora Creek. Water police found this $14,000 yacht aground in Dora Creek today. They also recovered three other runabouts that had been taken from their moorings overnight. Residents say they disturbed a couple of boys on board one of the boats. Police have since charged two youths with the illegal use of the vessels. The boys were apprehended when they allegedly returned to the scene today to collect a wallet and pair of shoes they'd left behind. The Water Police is maintaining an increased presence on Lake Macquarie as part of a trial program. They have any suspects in regards to any stolen property, uh, motors or radios, anything at all, to feel free to contact the police and uh, we'll treat everything confidentially. And as well as policing crime on the water, Launch Belmont is also assisting with rescue operations and checking boat registrations. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Carolyn Tebbett has run Palmdale's stud on the Central Coast for 23 years. Recently though, the business has taken a change in direction. Normally a horse would tower above me, but on this farm they're lucky to reach waist height. They're hardly huge, but these horses are fully grown, as are the goats, the cute cows and the mini mules. Like the uh, miniature horses and cows and everything, we're breeding down in size the uh, little donkeys as well. These are quite small donkeys, but of course uh, it takes time to actually breed down to miniature and that is the actual process that we're doing at the moment. This is the only miniature animal farm in the country which is open to tourists. Everybody seems to be extremely interested in seeing our babies. And if you're worried about the guard dogs, well, in keeping with the place, they're tiny too. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Police and fire officers went to the Gladiators base in Portland Street just after midnight. Within an hour the building was gutted, leaving a damages bill estimated at $30,000. Scientific police sifted through the remains and are certain the blaze was deliberately lit. And we believe there are some suspicious circumstances there. The brick, iron and fibro building was not insured. Police have ruled out an attack from a rival bikers gang. Detectives have called for any witnesses to come forward. Uh, we'd be making a plea to anyone that uh, saw anyone around the clubhouse from about 11.30 on to contact the Maitland Police. Forty-three-year-old farm labourer Albie Anderson was killed on New Year's Eve as he was walking home from the Glenray Hotel. The car that hit him failed to stop. Less than a month later, the community has rallied to raise money for Albie's wife and four children. There's a lot of people just writing out cheques and giving money for the family, which is great to see because he had a lot of friends and they're going to need it, you know. Fundraising began at midday and will continue until midnight.
Day two of the titles and again perfect conditions for the state's regional surf stars of the future. With 30 clubs and more than 2,000 youngsters competing, the titles are a preview to the state championships next month. It was another busy schedule for organisers, with the finals of most events being held today. The slight pickup in surf provided a challenge for the young competitors, but sometimes it was all too much. Of the major events, Sawtell won the march past, while Shell Harbour took out the all-age relay. A great day for the beach, but not the best conditions for the finals of the Australian Open surfing titles. Small waves made life tough for the four finalists, who emerged from a week of fierce competition to surf for the major prize. It was a battle of East versus West. Tony Seddon from Maroubra and Queensland's Grant Frost battling Western Australia's Peter Hayes and Dave Chick. It came down to a tussle between Frost and Seddon, the Queenslander tumbling out on the final wave to give Seddon the crown, and Seddon's own fan club was delighted. In the women's, New South Wales' Lynn McKenzie beat a top field to take the trophy. The contest was over, but the drama wasn't. Further up the beach, a 35-year-old man had fallen from a cliff. The man was found unconscious in the water. He was treated for spinal injuries at the scene before being airlifted to the Royal North Shore Hospital. In the Aussie spirit of two up and having a go, thousands flocked to Broadmeadow Racecourse for its Australia Day meeting. There were all the familiar inclusions, the tote, the bookies, the horses themselves and of course the fashions. Some of them second to none. Off the course, the young folk were creating fashions of their own. While mum and dad had a flutter on the fillies, the children were kept busy with entertainment literally style. All in all, it seems, racing is part of the Aussie culture. Win or lose. Oh, well, I think we've all up in that tradition, haven't we? We have a little bit of a punt. It'll be two up for races. We enjoy that. I certainly do anyway. I think so, yes. Everyone joining in together. True Aussies. <laughs> Best way to go brogue anyway. That's about all. <laughs> that was a bit of luck, you'd be right. And Lady Luck would have been high on the priority list of those betting on the feature event, which was race six, the Australia Day handicap, run over 1,200 metres. And a dead heat for first between two and three, with Gary Harley's pick top comment finishing third. The divvies, as you can see on your screen, the Quinella paid $24.80, the two trifectas for two, three and one paid $86.60, three, two and one paid $38.20. These guys are authentic cowboys, from the tip of their hats to the toes of their boots. And over the past three nights, they've provided crowds at Tamworth's indoor arena with some spectacular riding. And last night was no exception. Colin McPhee on toss up took out the crowd favourite bareback bronco event with a score of 84. Other events also reached final status, with Brad Scott taking out the chainsaw, Luke Lindley the bulls, and Rick Galloway the saddle bronx. After all was said and done, a couple of rodeo clowns entertained the crowd, 
helping the 1993 Tamworth shootout finish up with a bang. The usually quiet central coast village of Bateau Bay was teeming with angry residents and holiday makers this morning as they filed into the local Progress Hall grounds. More than 300 attended the rally against the proposed Blue Lagoon Beach Resort. I came here and had a look at the hall yesterday and I thought uh, possibly we won't fit them in the hall. I can say quite now my thoughts were, were very real. What has angered these people is the prospect of losing their local beach to a new development. Wyong Shire Council has approved a proposal to upgrade the existing caravan park by building cabins, recreation and eating areas and including development along the beachfront. During the rally, State MP Richard Jones told the gathering that the development is contrary to the state government's coastal planning policy. The question now remains whether Robert Webster and his advisers in the Department of Planning will abide by their current coastal policy or whether they will cave in to development interests. Mr Jones believes sheer weight of numbers will force the planning minister to block the proposal. I think the very fact you've come here today will be enough to convince the minister Robert Webster to veto this development as it stands now. I'm quite sure about that. The service at Christchurch Cathedral came as judges, magistrates and legal workers prepared for the new court season which starts today. Supreme Court sittings will hear hundreds of criminal and civil cases over the next 32 weeks. Ministers attempted to reaffirm community faith in the legal system, which like most other institutions has copped its share of criticism over the past year. Not even the traditional judges' wigs are safe, with calls for them to be done away with. Those gathered received the blessing, then filed out to a waiting police motorcade for a trip to the courthouse. On a rare occasion that a camera is allowed into the court, the sitting was declared open with civic leaders, members of the judiciary and the clergy present. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. Surfers were talking about it out the back at Newcastle Beach this morning. So were mums and dads who journeyed from near and far for a cool off. Yeah, in the surf, there's people talking about it. And what's the general idea out there? Uh, nobody's sort of taking it real seriously. We travel from Singleton down here, and it's a big difference for us if we've got to pay to come here. So I'd rather just leave it like it is. 
I think it's uh, rather ridiculous. I think that what they should ask is how much it cost them to make the inquiry in the first place. The idea of a beach fee was floated as a draft recommendation by a Resource Assessment Commission which has been conducting coastal management hearings around Australia, stopping into Newcastle last October. After hearing from Council's marine industry representatives, environment and community groups, the Commission identified public concern about water quality, natural habitat disturbance and coastal development. One of its draft suggestions was a user pays fee to be ploughed into environment protection. That's not likely in Newcastle. I certainly don't support it and I couldn't see any support for it in local government. I don't think they should do it. Nobody will come to the beach. I'd find another beach. There's been no suggestion as to which body would administer such a plan. Some Sydney councils have imposed parking fees on busy beaches already. We've not seen the need to do it here and I don't see that in the foreseeable future. Parking is always a problem but it's really on very, very few days of the year. Most reacted to the idea of a beach fee with surprise and disbelief. Even the idea of trying to collect such a charge could be like holding back the tide itself. Andrew Lobb reporting for NBN News. Trying to down the league leaders on their own turf is a tall order, but there's no better time for the breakers to travel south. After a slow start to the season, Bruce Dow's men are on a roll. In their last three encounters, the breakers have beaten Sydney CSC, West Adelaide and Preston to move to 24 points on the table and within range of a top six spot. Friday night's 4-1 win over Preston was just what the doctor ordered. Leading 3-1 at half time, Stowell ordered his men to take it easy. It was a go-slow tactic designed to save energy for tonight's match. But South Melbourne will be hoping prolific goal scorer Warren Spink used all his magic with this superb goal. An eight-horse field for the William Reed Stakes and Spanish Mix was the outsider, starting at 25 to 1. Based at Murrundi's Emirates Park, Spanish Mix had trouble early in the race. But heading home, the rough shot came up alongside the fastest sprinter in the land, Scalacci. With Newcastle jockey Alan Scores on board, Spanish Mix set a new course and race record. Scalacci second, Tangian Prince third. Twenty-eight-year-old busker Colin Stevens from Palamalawar, New Moree, can get his tongue around almost anything. It's a family trait. I had an uncle, his name was Uncle Joe, and he had a big mouth. And I thought, you know, there's someone in the family has got to follow his footsteps, and I reckon I'm, not, I'm the one that's doing it, mate. It started out as a trick at school, and it took quite a bit of work to get it right. I got a cricket ball stuck in my mouth once, mate, and um, I sort of panicked a bit then, <clears throat> and, uh, but I managed to get it out, mate. Colin is on the busking circuit performing around the countryside. He holds the world record for cigarettes in the mouth, 220 in one go, almost nine packets. And for the smokes, well, you'll need some matches. That's 450 in one mouthful. For some, it's an act that's hard to swallow. Sometimes he cops a mouthful, but mostly it's tongue in cheek. If you've got a big mouth, if you've got a great talent, well, the only way to go, you might just get out and get amongst it and to show people because, um, you know, everyone's got a gift, everyone's got a gift in life and I believe this is mine.
Traffic along Wharf Road was blocked by police after Navy divers from the patrol boat Warnambool, moored at Lee Wharf, found a package marked explosives floating about the harbour piers. It was fished out of the water, the Navy crew taking the precaution of covering the package with mattresses in case of a blast. On further investigation, the package was found to contain detonators used by railway workers who placed them on the tracks to warn of approaching trains. The detonators, believed to have been stolen, were recovered by State Rail. Meanwhile, a coronial inquiry is to be held into last Saturday's fatal powerboat crash on Newcastle Harbour. 45-year-old Queenslander Chris Antes, a competitor in the regatta powerboat Grand Prix, died after his boat flipped and broke up on a 160 km an hour turn during warm-ups. Newcastle Police wish to contact members of the public who may have shot home video of the incident. In March last year, Bill Borthwick was preparing to mow the back lawn of his Whitebridge home come post office. When wife Shirley yelled out, they'd been robbed. A man had demanded money and fled. Bill gave chase, running through bush and along railway lines. I just happened to see his red hat disappearing over the railway line and I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll have to clap on some pace if I'm going to catch him. An off-duty policeman finally overtook Bill and arrested the offender. The man was later charged and sentenced to 400 hours of community service. Bill received an award from Australia Post Area Manager John Erskine, along with the compliments of Chief Inspector Alan Bassett of Charlestown Police. Bill says he didn't set out to be a hero. What riled him was that the robbery was so close to home. I took it as a personal affront. Of, uh, it wasn't whose money it was stolen, it was, it was from our house. And that was the hard part. I couldn't swallow that. If it's been a few years since you visited the entrance, the sand build-up comes as a surprise. At first glance, it's more like a desert. Locals too have watched the steady siltation. All the marine life in the entrance has seemed to be disappearing. The growth on the rocks is disappearing. Sand's covering the rocks. So you can be out here fishing now and not even get a bite. And uh, you can walk right across from one side to the other the entrance now. Before you couldn't, there was no way you could do it. But you do it now. As well as being a magnet for generations of holiday makers, the entrance plays a vital role in the ecosystem of the Tuggera Lakes. For the past five years, the Wyong Shire Council and the Public Works Department have been working together to breathe new life back into the waterway. According to engineers, it seems a $12.5 million restoration effort is paying off. For the first time in many years, people are again swimming in parts of the lake, which until recently were infested with weed and booze and black mud. A $900,000 dredge was commissioned by Public Works Minister Wal Murray today. Its task will be to clear channels at the ocean mouth. It's an ongoing job though. Sand pumped onto the beach at north entrance will eventually be swept back by the prevailing conditions. Locals are dubious. It's got bad. And uh, my impression is we should have a break wall here. Urbanisation, industry and agriculture have all added to the nutrient build-up and sedimentation, but community-initiated efforts to clear the lakes have now become a model for government policy.
Rachel McQuillan was on home turf today for the official launch of a new junior training program. It's aimed at fostering the talent of the top players from the Hunter region, like Newcastle's up-and-coming star, Trudy Musgrave. And that's where Rachel fits in. She's been appointed Promotions and Public Relations Coordinator for Tennis Newcastle. When home, she'll train with the players and offer advice on the mental side of the game. She'll be able to pass on her expertise and what she's come through to get to where she is today. And Rachel appears happy to help. Every little bit helps at all and um, like I said before, it'll help anyone who's got the you know, determination to, to pursue tennis and uh, I think it's a great start for the kids. The training program is part of a total image overhaul for Newcastle Tennis. Time to turn tennis into a business. Like most sporting organisations here, if you wish to go ahead, you've got to make a business out of it. The whole concept has been made possible with today's announcement of a major corporate sponsorship deal with accounting company Coopers and Lybrand. Their injection of funds allowing the Newcastle Tennis Association to improve facilities and increase the number of national tournaments it hosts. The players went through their paces last night, their only training session before tomorrow's home game against Marconi. The Sydney Siders are placed second on the league ladder and are the NSL's top scoring team. Despite this, Breakers manager Bruce Stahl says there's no plan to play a defensive game. I believe the best form of defence is attack. For the last eight or nine weeks we've attacked every side and we've scored a lot of goals. We did that against South Melbourne last Monday and we came away with a one-all draw and I'm certainly not going to change for Marconi. After a disappointing start to the season, Newcastle has lost only one of its last nine games, moving to eighth spot on the ladder, only five points from the top six. This turnaround in form isn't luck. The ability to score goals and gain confidence from those goals that we scored has, has basically been the difference between the team prior to and since that change. And the Breakers' goal-scoring hopes aren't only pinned on striker Warren Spink. Bruce Stahl says there's half a dozen players with the talent and now the confidence to find the back of the net. Stahl has made one change to the 13-man squad. Darren Northam replaced by 17-year-old Mark Wilson, who made his debut in Newcastle's 4-1 win over Preston at home last Friday night. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. Many were looking forward to a cool change after sweltering heatwave conditions. It arrived with a bang early in the evening. Violent wind gusts picked up aircraft, cartwheeling and smashing them back to earth. Three were badly damaged. Two belonging to a pilot training school and a third privately owned by Noel Manning. For Noel it was the last blow in what's been a chequered past for the Piper Cherokee. It had been plagued by mechanical problems and had brought Noel safely back to earth in a forced landing in a paddock. I didn't even realise that it mine looked like that upside down. We just had new propellers fitted on and everything, all work done. Now this. If you'd just like to get off the air, and we'll have a discussion about it over there, OK? The damage comes as a blow to the training school. Replacement or repair costs to their aircraft could be more than $100,000. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. In the Hunter area, melanoma figures are well above the national average. Overall, cancer rates are in line with the state statistics, however those figures aren't good. In 1973, 332 per 100,000 men died of some sort of cancer. In 1990, 447. Cancers in women rose from 239 to 300. We know that uh, cancer is currently the second major killer after heart disease, but the rates are increasing. So we know that very soon it's going to become the major killer. 
The Cancer Council has released the figures to address funding and future research into the killer disease. The figures show that in the Hunter, breast cancer is on the rise. Over the last 17 years, there's been an increase of 28%, while prostate cancer figures are up 64%. A greater awareness of cancer in the community may have influenced the figures, but whatever the reason, researchers say it's an issue which has to be addressed. Residents are rallying together fighting mining company Commercial Minerals, which has a licence to explore a 60 kilometre square zone northeast of Patterson. The company is looking for zeolite, which is used in agricultural fertilisers. Last night, more than 200 people packed into the local School of Arts to fight any move to mine. If you are approached for permission, and we can help you to uphold your refusal to give that permission, Please let us know and we'll support you in every way we possibly can. Thank you very much. The Mount Thorley rail line is a vital link in the Hunter Valley's coal chain with 10 million tonnes transported down the track annually. This line here supplies the uh, highest volume of coal to the ports so um, obviously if this track is kept to standard and, and trains aren't delayed we're assured of a, a constant volume of, of coal to the ports. To keep the coal supply on the rails, a kilometre and a half of track is being upgraded this weekend. Old sleepers, rails and rock beds are being replaced by 50 men working around the clock. The cost for this weekend uh, is in the vicinity of $800,000 to a million dollars. Freight Rail says the new line will cope with the more powerful locomotives being introduced later this year. The upgrading project will take three weeks and three million dollars to complete but the line will be open again to the coal trains tomorrow. Scott Bevan, MBN News. Gough Whitlam not only loves history, he's become part of it, having been sacked as Prime Minister on November the 11th, 1975. And it was history that brought Mr Whitlam and his wife Margaret to Newcastle today, as guests of honour for a fundraising luncheon for the William IV. The rising generation in Newcastle, and also I would expect a very considerable number of visitors to Newcastle, will get a clearer view of the importance that this city, this port, has always had and should still have. At last the smoke has cleared as to when the federal election will be held and if the hundreds who craned their necks today to watch a skydiving team drop into this Lake Macquarie rally were impressed, those stunts are nothing compared to what we'll all see from the political candidates between now and March 13th. The rally was held to protest against development on Green Point, and one of Australia's most prominent environmentalists, Bob Brown, was guest speaker. Let's have no more of it. Let's at least keep what is left. And what I can see from 20... 7,000 or 30,000 feet there, which can nurture the bond that they have in, in amongst the trees. And so rapidly, Green Point... Greens have got a very strong role and will get the biggest vote in history because there are at least 15%, maybe more, of people who don't want to vote Labor or Liberal who are annoyed with the way the presidential-style election campaign's going. 
Scott Bevan, NBN News.